All right, the part of the chapter in 2 Timothy chapter 2 I'm going to be focused on is kind of right in the middle there. Real famous passage. Look at verse number 15. The Bible says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. God wants us to be intelligent. God wants us to be studying His word. Now, notice it says, Study to show thyself approved unto God. That is ultimately who we need to be worried about when we are learning our doctrine, when we are you know, understanding what he wants us to do in, in, in all of our education as far as that goes unto God. We are studying to show ourselves approved unto God. Don't worry about what man thinks and the standards that man makes. You know, maybe, maybe you are exceeding many, what, what many people would say, wow, you really, you know, because you read the Bible every day, wow, you are really, you know, doing way more than everyone else. You study your Bible a lot. And in man's eyes, it looks like, you know, such a huge thing that you're doing, such a such this great task you're doing. But we don't need to be concerned about what man thinks because you want to push yourself so that you're studying to make yourself approved unto God. And you look at the Bible and you think, what is God going to be happy with? What level of studying do I need to be investing in His Word? What level of reading, what level of, of devotion do I need to spend in learning His Word so that God would approve of what I'm doing? God would approve of my studying and um, you know, being a workman. And notice that too, it says a workman. It's not easy. It's not leisure time. Look, you're a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. You're doing work for God. And, it, you know, just like anything, imagine you had someone in a profession, in a computer profession. I, I'm, I'm in a computer field. I'm a programmer. If someone were to come to me, you know, I've been, I've been doing this for 10 years or longer, and uh, they were asking me a question specifically regarding the work that I do, and I, I didn't really have a good answer for him. That would be a shame on my part to just to not be able to explain things or not be able to give a good answer for something that, that I'm supposed to be working with every day, right? This is something that, that I deal with. It's my job. It's my responsibility. It's something that I do. You know, as a workman, I would be ashamed to not be able to, to give a basic answer or even a little bit more complicated answer on something regarding specifically my work, about, you know, whether about, about programming or whatever the, the case may be. Well, as a student of the Bible, someone who, who wants to study God's Word, even as a Christian, right, you are a workman, but you want to be a workman that's not ashamed. You need to be able to, to be smart with the Bible, not just say, well, I don't understand any of the Bible. Well, look, then get in and start reading more and start praying more and doing more and listening to more sermons and coming to church more and doing whatever it is you can do to understand God's word more so that you can be a workman that's not ashamed. So that way when you go out and preach the gospel to people, as we're commanded to do, as something every saved person should be doing, when someone hits you with a question, you're not just ashamed because you have no idea how to answer it. When someone says, well, I don't really believe hell is real. Are you able to show them some verses where, you know, where Jesus Christ himself is talking about hell? Do you, do you have any idea where to go? Do you even know what to say? Or anything for that matter. You know, I mean, any, any you know, common thing that you're going to hear from, from an unsaved person, any, any type of uh, claim that they might make, you know, are you just a workman that's ashamed? Do you have no idea what to answer that? You know, we, we ought to be ready to give everyone an answer for the, for the hope that we have. But, um, you know, here the Bible is saying, you know, we need to study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And that's the title of my sermon this morning, is Rightly Dividing the Word of Truth. There's a lot of teachers out there that, and, and actually it's the, you know, these pastors and these people who believe in this dispensational theology that love to cling to this rightly dividing the word of truth. And we're going to go over what rightly dividing the word of truth even is. Because what a lot of people will do is they're rightly dividing as they're taking a, a, a sword and it's going <laughs> and chopping it all up and then trying to put pieces together. That's not rightly dividing the word of truth. It's actually really simple. But we'll get into that near the end of the sermon. I'm going to deal with a lot of problems that people who love to cling to this, this phrase, well, you need to rightly divide the word of truth. You know, people will say like, when I say, people have always been saved by grace through faith. 
You say, oh, well, you're not rightly dividing the word of truth. You see, just because you think that we have grace now, that's always been that way. You know, it has because that's what the Bible says. We need to be able to rightly divide the word of truth. But look at what he's warning against here in verse 16. He's contrasting rightly dividing the word of truth with, but shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. He's saying, shun it. Don't have anything to do with, it, with the vain babblings, people just saying stupid things, saying things that don't have meaning, and the, the profane babblings, people who are um, you know, profaning the word of God. He says, and their word, verse 17, and their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus. So he's naming a couple of preachers here, Hymenaeus and Philetus, and you say, well, wait, what do, what do you mean they're preachers? It just says vain babblings. I mean, that could just be some fool just, just with vain babblings. Here's how we know that, it's, that they're actually preachers that he's preaching against. Look at verse number 18, the next verse. He, he tells us what they were doing. Who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already. So the vain babblings that they're, that they're speaking is talking about their, their heresy, their false doctrine that the resurrection has already happened. Now, what's he talking about? The future resurrection, right? This is talking about future events. And it's still a future event today. This is in, you know, what he's writing to 2 Timothy. It's after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, but before the resurrection of the dead. So obviously when... Uh, there's Christ the first fruits, talking about the, res the three resurrections. There's Christ the first fruits. Then those of us who are alive and remain at the, at the coming of the Lord Jesus. And then cometh the end, right? At the final judgment when there's that final resurrection. So what these people, what Hymenaeus and Philetus were saying, oh yeah, basically like the second coming of Christ has already happened. And there's people out there that believe that even to this day. There's people that believe that that has already happened. But what he says, saying that the resurrection has passed already and overthrow the faith of some. See, they're messing around with people's faith and you know, with all this false doctrine and this heresy, saying that, oh yeah, the resurrection has passed already. Now, I think it's very interesting that the people that he's referring to and the people that he's calling out is regarding an, a more of an end times type of event. The resurrection being passed. And Lately, there are people that are, that are trying, they'll try to use this phrase, rightly dividing the word of truth, while at the same time spewing their profane and vain babblings regarding the pre-trib rapture. And we're going to get into that. Turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. I've heard this argument recently, but I've heard it in the past before. It's not anything new as far as... See, what's happening now is they're starting to get a lot more people upset because of the, uh, the documentary that came out after the tribulation has reached so many people and has, has gotten into so many churches. And people are waking up to the truth that Christians are going to go through tribulation. That it's going to happen. And that this concept of this secret rapture and Jesus Christ coming back and, and, and all of a sudden the believers are just going to be gone before anything bad starts to happen is a lie. And it's false. And that, this lie will overthrow the faith of some when the bad times start to happen. Oh, I thought Jesus was going to come and rapture us up. I guess he's not coming then. I guess that was just a lie. Yeah, it was a lie. And it's going to overthrow the faith of some. Because they were deceived by this false heretical doctrine. But we're going to look at Matthew 24. Look at verse number 1. And I'm not going to get too far into this because I'm going to be preaching on this on uh, the Wednesday night for our prophecy week. But let's see what uh, verse number 1 says. Matthew 24, it says, And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. And then he goes on and he continues the chapter and he goes into all the details about the, the second coming of Jesus Christ because that's what they asked him about. What's the sign of thy coming? Well, let me tell you. Here it is. And he goes through the whole list. And I'm not going to go through and teach that doctrine tonight. But what I am going to do is teach the doctrine of rightly dividing the word of truth. 
Because you're going to hear arguments from people where they're going to tell you, you need to rightly divide the word of truth and it means this. And what they'll do is they'll say, when you read scripture, you need to look, who are they talking to? Who's the audience, right? And, and um, who are the passages given to? Because they're only, uh, someone who holds to a pre-tribulation rapture, one of the only arguments they can make to, to, to try to reconcile Matthew 24 with their, with their belief is that, oh, everything that you read in Matthew 24 is given to the Jews. All of this stuff that's just for the Jews, it's just for them because God's a respecter, because God cares whether or not they're born physically of the seed of Israel. All of this prophecy, and even though he's answering, what shall be the signs of thy coming, that's just for the Jews. It must just be the coming for the Jews. Not the second coming of Jesus Christ, but just the coming for the Jews. And they'll say, see, wait, look, when you back up to the beginning of Matthew 24, who is he talking to? He's talking to his disciples, and his disciples were Jews, so this must just be for the Jews. And they'll say, see, you've got to rightly divide the word of truth. You've got to look at the audience. And this is probably one of the dumbest arguments I've ever heard. It, it really is. You have to be stupid to make that type of an argument of, oh, well, He's talking to his disciples here, so this must, everything he says must just be for his disciples. I mean, that's like saying, well, his disciples are all dead now. So what he said to them, I mean, maybe it was just for them because he just answered them. Trying to say it, oh, it make, make equivalent his disciples with the Jews. Well, was Judas there? Because Judas wasn't even saved. And yet he told Judas about these things. What is that going to have to do with him? He's not going to see any of it. So when you, when you start looking at, well, who is it, who is it given to, you're going to go down the wrong path. It's, it's not a solid argument what, whatsoever. And then to what end are you going to take this type of thinking? The reason why they do that here is because they need to find some way to reconcile this passage. They have no way of doing it. But if you take that argument to its logical end, where, where is it going to lead you to? Think about Timothy, right? We just read from 2 Timothy chapter 2, rightly dividing the word of truth. Well, that was an epistle written to Timothy. That wasn't written unto the church. That was written to one man. So I guess that whole path, First and Second Timothy, we shouldn't even mess with it, right? Don't bother with it because that was given to Timothy. That was just for Timothy. And who was Timothy? Oh, well, let's look. I mean, the Bible says in Acts 16, Then came he to Derbe and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timotheus, which is Timothy, the son of a certain woman, which was a Jewess and believed, but his father was a Greek. Uh-oh, how are we supposed to divide the word of truth now with First and Second Timothy? Is it to the Jews or is it to the Greeks? Or is it only to people who are mixed, of mixed descent? They have some Jew and some Greek background, those half-Jews. That's who the book of First and Second Timothy is to, since Timothy himself was half-Jew and half-Greek. It's stupid. That is, that is not what the Bible means when it says, rightly divide the word of truth. Go and look and see of what nationality the people are who are speaking. I mean, Jesus Christ himself was sent unto the lost sheep of Israel. So you're going to say everything that Jesus said then is not for us because we're Gentiles and we're not Jews and Jesus was only speaking to the Jews? That's a large portion of, of Scripture to get rid of considering Jesus Christ is the word. He is the word of God made flesh. But somehow now parts of Jesus aren't for us. Even though he's our savior. Even though man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Oh wait, but that was said to Satan. Remember that? Satan tempted Jesus Christ in the wilderness and that was the response. When, when Satan tempted Jesus Christ to make that stone into bread, what was his answer? I actually think I put that in my notes here. I don't know. His answer was, maybe it's not. His answer was, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Well, who was his audience? Satan. So I guess that verse is only for Satan and there's nothing that we could learn about that? That's not a solid doctrine for us. That's just for, that's just for the unbelievers. That's just for the, the children of Satan. That's just stupid. 
I mean, think about that. What about the gospel then according to Luke and the book of Acts? Both of those start off, they were addressed unto Theophilus. So I guess those are just for Theophilus. Or do we even care about that? Is that something we even need to consider? If it's the word of truth, if it's God's holy word, then it's truth. And it's truth for us, it's truth for Jews, it's truth for non-Jews, it's truth for women, it's truth for men. Look, it's the truth. Going back to Matthew 24. Look at verse number 33. Because what happens is they like to have their, their stupid answer, rightly divide the word of truth, and say, well, he was only talking to the Jews here, so it must just be for the Jews, even though it doesn't say that anywhere in Scripture that this is just meant for the seed of the physical seed of Israel. Nowhere can you get that by reading the text. They just get that because he was speaking to his disciples. And I don't know what they're going to do with Simon the Canaanite, but whatever. Matthew 24, look at verse number 33, the Bible says, So likewise ye, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near even at the doors. So when ye see all these things, he just, he just means the Jews. They just insert Jews there that, at that point. But what's really interesting is when you compare all of the, same, the accounts of the same sermon in the, in the other Gospels, for example, in Mark, uh, Mark 13, which is the parallel passage for Matthew 24. Because supposedly everything that he's telling them here in Matthew 24 is only for the Jews, right? That those are the signs for the Jews for the coming of the Son of Man, not for us. Well, in Mark 13, starting in verse 35, the Bible reads, Watch ye therefore, for ye know not when the master of the house cometh, at even or at midnight, or at the cock crowing, or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. And look at verse 37. And what I say unto you, I say unto all. Watch. This stupid doctrine of saying, well, he's only talking to his disciples, so he was only meant it for the Jews. He said specifically, what I say unto you, I say unto all. It's like God knew in advance that this stupid argument was going to arise and he already had an answer for it in scripture what i say unto you i say unto all oh that just means all jews get out of here if that's what you think you you, <laughs> you need to learn how to rightly divide the word of truth but these people that try to disprove the post-trib rapture they want to have it both ways because there's a lot of sections of Matthew 24 that they're going to want to pull out and use saying, oh yeah, this is talking about the coming of Jesus Christ. Oh yeah, this is the part that talks about... Because um, even in Matthew 24, look at verse number... Um, like verse 36, But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. See, they'll take that verse out and see, oh yeah, that's talking about the, the rapture. The rapture of the saints, those, those non-Jews. That's what that's talking about. Well, wait a minute. This is in the same context. He hasn't even stopped speaking yet. He's, he's, he's preaching unto his disciples. It's all in the same, the same audience, right? So I guess that must just be for the Jews too. And if you keep reading, it says, But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Well, I guess that's only for the Jews too, right? I mean, this isn't, for, this isn't talking about our rapture. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving marriage. And it goes on and on. Then shall two be in the field, the one shall be taken, the other left. Look, these are all verses that people who believe in a pre-trib are all going to ascribe to the coming of Jesus Christ and their rapture. How is it then that you can say, oh, we don't have to worry about Matthew 24, verse 29, saying immediately after the tribulation of those days. We don't have to worry about that verse. Because that's only talking to the Jews. Because that's where the Jews' rapture happens. Oh, but then all of a sudden, later as he's speaking, now all of a sudden it encompasses the Gentiles. Now all of a sudden it's something that we want to use. It's ridiculous. I mean, the, the fact that people could even get deceived by such a lame argument, it, it boggles my mind. Now, <laughs> what, and what's really funny about this, if you keep reading, 
Matthew 24, right? If you have a red letter Bible like I do, look, this is Matthew 24 and 25. It's all red. What does that mean? Jesus is continuing to speak. Okay, he continues to go on and on and on. So even though our chapter ends at chapter 24, it doesn't mean that Jesus Christ stopped speaking at the end of chapter 24. Because he didn't. He kept going on. This is the same audience, the same everything, continues on into Matthew chapter 25. To where basically all, yes, all of Matthew 25 is a continuation from Matthew 24. And it's all Jesus Christ speaking to them nonstop, same audience. So if you are going to apply Matthew 24 verse 29 to say that's just for the Jews because of what? Because of who he's speaking to? Because he's speaking to his disciples? Then you have to say all of Matthew 24 is just for the Jews and all of Matthew 25 is just for the Jews. You cannot mix and match what you want to have applied to the Jews and what, who, who you don't based on who the audience is as your argument. So that means that, you know, in Matthew 24, it talks about, or in Matthew 25, it talks about the ten virgins, that parable, which preachers love to preach on that, and uh, many parables about the kingdom of heaven. I guess none of that has to do with us according to their way of thinking. Or, um, yeah, I have that here. I wrote it down here in Matthew 4. Jesus was speaking unto, unto Satan when he was being tempted in the wilderness. Or even in Matthew 10, he has direct orders to his disciples. Uh, Matthew 10, verse 5 says, These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them. So the twelve apostles, the twelve disciples he sent out, specifically, he was speaking unto them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not. So I guess when he sends them out soul winning, that's only for his disciples, that's not for anybody else. I mean, you could say even when he said, Go ye unto, unto, all, uh, unto all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. Who is he speaking to? Oh, well, he was speaking to the church then. Oh, all of a sudden the church doesn't have Jews in it? Now that's that. Well, that's the church, so that's for us. I thought his disciples were part of the first church. I thought Jesus Christ founded the church. So how can you say that Matthew 24 is for Jews because he's speaking to his 12 disciples who are Jews? And it's not the church somehow? Turn, if you would, to Matthew 10. Because these people that make that argument, the argument that, I, that, I, that I'm refuting tonight, will never say in Matthew 10, verse 27, that, that that is just for the Jews. Even though when you look at the audience, look at who he's talking to, he's talking to his 12 disciples, they will ne it's the same exact thing, the same exact audience. Matthew 10, 27 says, What I tell you in darkness, that speak ye in light. And what ye hear in the ear, that preach ye upon the housetops. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Yeah, I guess that's just for the Jews, right? Not for us. Look at the audience. Rightly divide the word of truth. Or how about this one, 10, 37, Matthew 10, 37. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. You say, Pastor Burson, that's pretty ridiculous to think that those verses would only be applied to the Jews. Yeah, I agree. It's just as ridiculous as saying Matthew 24 only applies to the Jews. It doesn't make any sense. And don't tell me that nobody makes that argument because I've seen it and I've heard it. And it's actually, there's, you know, there's, there's a, a big name preacher out there named Sam Gipp. He's like a Hymenaeus or Philetus that want to overthrow the faith of some. He has his vain babblings. He's the one that I heard make this argument. You know, this is the same guy. I, I could not believe. I, his, he put this up on his own YouTube channel. And I listened to it. I watched it. I heard him say out of his own mouth, now I think he was speaking to a group of pastors is what, is what came across as. Because what he said from behind the pulpit, what he was speaking, he said, he, and I, forgive me, I don't have the exact quote. You can look it up for yourself. 
But he said, the people in the congregation are stupid. They're stupid. Now, what if you were saying, of course it's safe for him to say that when he's talking to a bunch of pastors, right? Now, I, if I were sitting there, I'd be like, this guy's a fool trying to say that the congregation is stupid, that the people sitting in the pews are stupid. I sat in the congregation for a long time. I didn't think I was stupid. I have the, you know, people that sit in my congregation, I don't think you're stupid. I think you're very intelligent. But Sam Gimp, think, Sam, Gip, <laughs> Sam, Gimp, Sam Gip thinks you're stupid. And especially anybody who believes in the post-trib rapture, you're stupid too. And you can, you can look up his exact quote. I don't have it, but, he, but he, that's, that's the intent of what he was saying. And what boggles my mind is to think that he even, you know, he has the, the boldness to put that video up on his own YouTube channel where like people who listen to him are going to be hearing him say, yeah, the people in the congregation are stupid. Well, apparently if they're listening to him, they probably are stupid. Because if you're willing to accept the argument that he's trying to make about the pre-trib rapture and Matthew 24 only being to the Jews because I rightly divide the word of truth and that he's just talking to the Jews. If you're going to fall for that without just being able to, to critically think and say, okay, if this is the way that we're supposed to divide the Bible, then let me go back to Matthew 10. Let me look at Matthew 25. I'm going to have to apply that same reasoning across the board to everything. And it's stupid. The Bible says that all Scripture, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. All Scripture. Not the little portion of Scripture that's for you, but see, the dispensationalists, they want to chop it all up and say, well, this section of Scripture is for the pre-flood world. This section of Scripture is for the Mosaic Law area. This, this section of Scripture is for... And none of and these, these don't apply to us. We're in the church age. So we get this. And some of them will say, yep, we don't even use the whole New Testament. We only look at the epistles of Paul. It's out there, my friends. People will believe that the only portion of Scripture that we should be following are the epistles of Paul. That's it. As if, as if you know, in the epistle of Paul in 2 Timothy 3.16, doesn't matter. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. All Scripture is profitable. That's why we read the whole Bible. That's why I preach from the whole Bible because my job is to preach the whole counsel of God. Not part of it, not what Paul said, not just, not just what Paul said, not just what Jesus said, not just what any of these people said because, hey, when it boils down to it, it's all Jesus anyways. It's all the Word of God. And it's all profitable. And don't be fooled by these false teachers because, like Sam Gipp, he's real strong, King James only. And he puts out a lot of material out there that says he's King James only, you know. And that's one of the things where you, where you can get sucked in because you think, wow, he's like us. He's a Baptist and he's King James only. And, and he's putting out this material. He must be a really good guy. He must, he must be teaching the truth. Well, watch out for him. I mean, you, you want to listen to him, go ahead. But I'm just saying, you got to watch out. There's a lot of people out there, these hyper-dispensationalists that, that, yeah, they're King James only. They're right about that. You know, a broken clock is wrong twice a day. But they get, they'll get you sucked into their, their heretical teachings that way because you let your guard down thinking, oh, this, is, this must be okay. We always need to think critically. And I don't care. You, you need to be thinking critically no matter who's doing the preaching. No matter where you're hearing. Don't let your guard down ever. Always be able to critically listen and, and search the Scriptures daily whether these things be so. No matter who it is. I don't care if you... If you come from, you know, you go back to our sending church or you go to any of these other churches that are great churches that, that I love and I, and I think they're preaching the truth, but hey, I'm always going to be listening critically to what's being taught and what's being said because you have to. So whether it comes from someone you don't know and you say, well, they're teaching the King James Bible, I'm not saying don't listen to them. 
Just make sure you're able to think critically. And when they, when they come up with, with their reasoning or with an argument, especially when it's just logic or reasoning, as opposed to clear, concise scripture. Because he has no clear, concise scripture to say that what Jesus is explaining when they asked him, what the, you know, what's the sign of your coming, that is only talking about an event for the Jews. That is not clear anywhere in Scripture. The only reason they even say things like that is because it contradicts their pet doctrine that they don't want to admit is false. For whatever reason, whether it's pride, they don't want to be able to stand up and say, yes, what I was taught was wrong. Who knows, who knows what the reason? I don't know. I, I can only venture to guess why they might want to cling to something that's false and just have to come up with, with whatever they can come up with to try to combat the truth. But it's in vain. But just always be able to, to think critically when you hear things and, and say, okay, if I'm going to accept what you're saying here, then how do I apply that to everything? Because you have to be able to do that. You can't just pick and choose and cherry pick and say, yep, that's for the Jews and this isn't, even though it's the same criteria. Right? The criteria of who the audience is. I'm not saying that the audience is never important or should never be taken into consideration. But if you're going to make a claim, you're going to make a statement of saying this is only to the Jews because of the audience, you better be prepared to, to make that application throughout the whole Word of God and make sure that it makes sense. So how do we rightly divide the Word of Truth? First of all, we don't add things that aren't there. Okay, adding to God's word and removing from God's word is a, is a pretty big deal. Read Revelation 22 at the very end. He'll tell you, God tells you what he thinks about that. But see, like the, the dispensationalists, they add these time periods and, and they call them dispensations, which is not what the word means. And, and they'll start saying, well, that's how we need to understand and rightly divide the word of truth is by understanding it in these dispensations and how everything was different. Now, and, and, you know, I've... Uh, I've talked to a dispensationalist before, which he wasn't a hyper dispensationalist, thank God. Otherwise, you know, I probably wouldn't have agreed with him on so many other things. But what they try to do is he says, okay, well, and I don't know to what extent he believes. He's not like a really good friend of mine or anything, but he's, he's a preacher and he preaches the right gospel and, and, and he's saved and he's doing a good work for the Lord. But... Um, you know, I asked them right off the bat, I was like, so wait a minute, do you believe that people were saved differently in the Old Testament and going to be saved differently in the end days? And, you know, and he said, no. He said he believes salvation's always been by grace through faith. If people, you know, and, and that's what they'll call, there's a distinction between the hyper-dispensationalists and the dispensationalists. The hyper-dispensationalists are the ones that'll say there were different ways of salvation, different means of being saved throughout the Bible, depending on where you are in history. And what's so stupid about that, too, it's real easy for them to say that, like, in the middle of a so-called age. What do you do about the transition time? What do you do about that? I mean, you know, for people to say, for example, and I'm not saying dispensations believe this, but when people say you have to be baptized in order to be saved, like in this morning's sermon. And what they'll do is they'll say, well, because you have the example of the thief on the cross, obviously baptism wasn't required then because he was saved without getting baptized. So they just make it up that, well, it must have started when Jesus Christ resurrected from the dead. Now all of a sudden, baptism is required. Well, then what happens to the person who died the day after Jesus Christ resurrected from the dead? They believed on him, but they never got baptized. I guess they go to hell. I mean, is there a grace period? Do we have, do we have, does God give a time frame and say, okay, well, I know this is a brand new thing, brand new, new requirements to be, to go to heaven. So I'll give you a year or two years or five. I mean, what is it? Or is there just time cut off now? Boom, done. Sorry, you missed it. And you have to think about these things, especially when you're dividing things up into times. Well, what, what about the in-between stage? What about when things are changing? Why are they, are they explicitly changing? <clears throat> I don't see anywhere in the Bible saying that, that you have to be baptized to be saved, but all things that you have to think about. 
So how do we rightly divide the word truth? First of all, we don't add things there. We don't need to, to make up these dispensations. Oh, I was telling you the story about this guy. So the way that he was trying to explain, he said, he just asked me some questions. He said, well, think about in the Garden of Eden. Were things different or the same than they are today? And go, well, of course they're different, right? Man hadn't sinned yet. Yeah, things are, you know, the, the, the ground was producing fruit and the man didn't have to work and all, you know, and all these other things. It was great. It was a paradise. Of course they were different. Okay, well, what about, uh, you know, when, when Moses, when the children of Israel were in Egypt? You know, they haven't even been given the law yet. Wasn't things a little bit different then? Yeah, sure. How about when they were in the wilderness or when they got into the promised land and Moses gave them the law and they started doing these rituals and these other things? Weren't things different then than they were back? Yeah, sure, they were a little bit different. Okay. I'm not disputing that God reveals more of his word as time has progressed and that there have been certain changes made to the law or you know, the, the, even the law being given. But that doesn't mean that you chop them up into periods of time. If you say, okay, well, the law lasted from, from the time Moses gave it to the children of Israel until the time of Christ or until his resurrection or whatever. Fine, you know, that's, that's fine where that was being observed but it was never a means of salvation. And by doing that, what are you really proving anyways? Saying, well, this is okay. These are some years that the law was fine. I have no problem with that, but why, why do you have to call yourself a dispensationalist? What's the point of that? What, is the, you know, what are you getting at here? You know, what's the point of it? But they try, to, they try to use real simple things like that, and then the crazy doctrine comes later. Now we've got you thinking, oh, okay, now you're thinking in terms of dispensations, and now you're thinking, oh, well, this scripture only applies to this, and this, you know, no. It's not the way it works. You find evidence, see, even before Moses was given the law, there's evidence of the law being enforced prior to that. And we've gone through quite a bit of that going through the book of Genesis. We see, you know, for example, the tithe being given, Abraham giving tithe, Jacob giving a tithe. We see um, plenty of other things, plenty of things going on where um, they weren't quite given by, to Moses yet, but they were already learned, they were already known. See, when God would audibly speak unto Adam and unto other people, you know, uh, there's bits and pieces of his, of his word and his law were given unto them that we don't even know about, they weren't written down. But we don't need to, to understand the Bible and dispensations in order to rightly divide the, truth, the word of truth. Rightly dividing the word of truth, there's two, there's, there's one division. The Old Testament from the New Testament. That's rightly dividing the word of truth because that's what we have. There's everything that happened in the Old Testament and everything that happened in the New Testament. And if you want to make a division, that's, that's the proper way to do it. Because things have changed. There has been a change. But the way that we look at it is when the change comes, well, we need to rely on God to explicitly tell us what those changes are. We can't just assume that God changed something without having a scripture to back it up. Obviously, the sacrifices are no longer happening. That is a change that was made to the law. But just because one thing changed doesn't mean that everything has changed. And the, way, the best way to, to understand and interpret the Bible is to take it literally. Say, this is what the Bible says. God's not trying to confuse you. God's not trying to make things difficult. He's not the author of confusion. He's not trying to, to make you work at it really hard just in order to understand it. Look, he wants you to work at it and, and, and know it and, and be able to live his word and apply his word. But he didn't make it difficult. We're the ones that make it difficult, if anything. His word's not complicated. It's not that hard to understand. He gives us some pretty simple rules and, and some si pretty simple concepts. Man is the one who makes it confusing and difficult. But we need to be able to build our doctrines on clear statements, too. We're going to rightly divide the word of truth. Then what we do, we, we build a foundation of what we believe. And that foundation is just what I'm going through. The foundational beliefs of, of word of truth Baptist church um, on our Sunday morning series, 
you know, salvation by grace through faith, the King James Bible, baptism, all of these things, there are, there are an abundance of clear scripture regarding each one of those things. And as you, you determine, you know, you're um, building your belief system, all of your doctrines, everything you believe, it should all start from foundational, very clear scripture. You cannot refute this. There is plenty of scriptural evidence to support. This is what the Bible's saying. And from that, you add on that. And we know that the Scripture cannot contradict itself. If it's God's Word, then it doesn't contradict itself. God doesn't make mistakes. He doesn't make errors. So you start building on that. So then when you start getting the things that are a little bit more confusing, maybe you don't quite understand them. They're not quite as clear as all these other Scriptures you've read. You need to be able to fit that into your belief system. But you can't have any contradictions. But you work from the bottom up where you're laying down the foundation. Look, I know this is true. You're not going to tell me different. I, I know salvation is by grace through faith. You're not going to tell me any different. I know that there are no works involved. That is something that has gone over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. I could give you hundreds of scriptures that say so. So when I'm trying to understand James chapter 2 that says faith without works is dead, I'm not going to throw away all this other mountain of scripture that I have just because I don't understand this one verse that says, oh, wow, well, maybe we do need to have works for salvation. No. We've settled that. We've established that. Now I need to understand what this other verse means. And that's where heresies come from. They come from the, either the parables or these stories that have scripture that's not quite as clear as everything else. So when we're building our doctrine, when we're rightly dividing the word of truth, we're building a foundation, first of, first of all, on the clear stuff. And from that, you add to it and make sure you have no contradictions. And basically, you know, the last thing with the Old Testament being separated and divided, I mean, it's even divided in our Bibles. You have the Old Testament, and there's a division, and then you get into the New Testament. And that is rightly dividing the Word. I mean, right here, I've got a whole blank pages, right? It's divided. Now we're in the New Testament. Two separate collection of books. The Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Covenant and the New Covenant. And it's all explained in the New Testament what's been changed. Which is why we continue to, to observe or, or um, respect the laws that God has given in the Old Testament. His moral laws that still apply today. That should still apply today. That, that would to God, we have a nation of people who believe that, that the law of the Lord is righteous, converting the soul. And the way that we divide the word of truth is saying, if the Bible does not, if it's not explicitly, if it's not clearly said that this has been done away with, then we don't believe it's been done away with. So, for example, you know, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Well, we have scripture that says, you know, one man regardeth one day above another, the other man esteemeth every day the same. Let every man be persuaded in his own mind. Okay, there's one scripture. There's scripture that says that Jesus Christ was our rest and that the, the Sabbath, the rest on the Sabbath was just fulfilling the, the prophecy of Jesus Christ and that he came and brought that rest to us, which is why that no longer needs to be observed the way that it was in the Old Testament, just like the lamb doesn't need to be slain because Jesus Christ is the lamb slain once from the foundation of the world. And when he came and performed a sacrifice, the symbol is no longer necessary because he's already come. So anything that was symbolic and, and done ritualistically in that manner to teach the people at that time and to give them the vision of the future and what they needed to believe on and, and that those core fundamentals that they needed to believe on, hey, once Jesus came, a lot of that stuff has been fulfilled. So we don't need to observe it anymore because it's already been done. But if it hasn't been, if we, if we can't clearly see that from Scripture then we say, yeah, you know what? That still applies today. It still applies that, that you shouldn't marry your sister or your cousin. Well, I don't know if your cousin's probably allowed in the Bible, but uh, you know, there's, there's a certain level that, that you, need to, you need to be able to, to adhere to. Still, that's still right and still wrong. Um, that's how you rightly divide the word truth. So don't get, don't get turned around by these, these people, especially 
you know, dispensationalists are, are just crazy anyways. They want to chop it up and say, well, we're the only ones that are rightly dividing the word of truth. And they try to make you feel bad or stupid like you don't know how to, you know, we know how to rightly divide the word of truth. And they get all proud about it like, like ha, 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 you silly person, you don't know how to rightly, like, you don't know what you're talking about. You're not rightly dividing. Like, they're not rightly dividing. They're dividing way too much and chopping up and, and resting scripture and trying to wrestle with it and make it say things that it doesn't. Take the literal approach. Just read it and, and, and take it for what it says. Take it for the surface meaning. Take it for what there's... I'm not saying there's no deeper meanings, but let's just get the surface read. I mean, if, if, if his disciples are saying, look, what's the sign of the times of, of, of thy coming? Just believe that he's answering them according to the signs of his coming again. And that... There's no special secret coming for the Jews or for the Greeks or for anybody else for that matter that's, that's not given, especially when all of the other um, events that surround his coming are, are, are all talked about in the various places, the sun and being darkened and the moon being turned to blood and, and the stars falling from heaven and not giving their light and all this stuff that happens. It, it's, it's all consistent with the coming of Jesus Christ, with his second coming. And he said that there's not going to be five comings or six or seven there's the first fruits then the rapture then the end and that's it there are no more raptures besides those or, or multiple comings of jesus christ that's it let's bow our heads have a word of prayer dear heavenly father lord we thank you so much for your clear words scripture is not you haven't made it difficult for us to understand Lord, sometimes we're not always able to understand your words just due to our own um, lack of intelligence or our own um, manipulation or, or, or inability to, to comprehend. But that's, that's our own fault, dear Lord. It's not because you didn't make it easy enough for us. It's our own shortcomings that, uh, that caused that to happen. Or it's the influence of false preachers out there that are, that are trying to twist around our understanding of, of your clear, simple words. Lord, help us to be able to rightly divide your word by just taking it for what it says, dear God, and understanding it for what it says and not trying to force a doctrine to fit into your word. Um, anytime we try to do that, dear Lord, we're just going to end up failing and, um, and looking like fools, as, as many have done already. And uh, Lord, I pray that you please just... just Help us to grow and to uh, learn more from your words. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.